The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It is Monday. It's January 14th, 2013. I don't know that I've said that enough times. 2013. It just feels a little on the odd side. In any case, we're so excited to be with you here today to be starting off this new year. I have to be honest, as I woke up this morning, I was struck by the fact that this is a bit of an anniversary week for me uh, because it was this week seven years ago that my child was diagnosed with autism uh, seven years and it's really made me think about how different things are in the world of autism seven years later how different things are in in our individual world uh, and how things are different with him and uh, I remember when my son was diagnosed with autism one of the things that was said to me was you know you're very fortunate to be living at this time and not 50 years ago because we've learned more about autism in the last five years than we knew in all the 50 years previous to that. And I, I have heard people say that because uh, I remember thinking, wow, well, if that's amazing, that's a, if that's true and it's amazing if it's true, then what will it be like in the next five years and the five years after that? Uh, we are not where we want to be yet, but we have made great strides and uh, we'll continue to do that. That's sort of our mission. We're going to be with you live for the next two hours talking about that and more, uh, about how we create progress for our children on the autism spectrum and our young adults on the spectrum and our adults on the spectrum, how we create progress for ourselves, um, whether we're on the spectrum or not, getting answers to questions and asking questions that lead to more questions, right? Because that's part of what this gig is. Uh, so we're going to be doing all of that, as I said, and more. want to remind you that this show is meant to be interactive. We really want your input. We want to know what kinds of things you'd like for us to be talking about. We want to know your suggestions, your questions, your comments, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what's going on in your neck of the woods. And Emily is cycling through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us um, because we know that the way you communicate and the way you engage is different Sometimes it's different based on the month. Sometimes it's different on what time of day it is. I know, you know, sometimes I'm only on my phone. Other times I have computer. <laughs> you know, it's, it's different for all of us at different times. So please take a look at the list of things. But know that if you'd like to watch us live, there is still only one place that you can do that right now. And that is autism-live.com. When you go there, you'll see our new website. And there's a desktop there. On the desktop, there is a place where it says uh, questions being answered right now. If you put your cursor there when we're live, you can type in whatever you'd like, hit enter, and it shows up magically here on my desktop. I want to remind you that there is no cost for that. There is no, you don't have to log in. I just love that. I, there have been some sites that I've been on where I wanted information and wanted to get hooked up with the information, and the login was so lengthy and time consuming that I just about pulled my hair out. Um, but we don't do that to you. So feel free to write in whatever you want. We try to get to as many of those comments as possible. We try to check in on Facebook and tw Twitter as well every day to kind of see what you guys have going on. Um, but feel free to keep asking and if you see that we're we're not getting to your question be you know perseverate <laughs> be perseverant uh we want you to we want to answer your questions and uh we want to hook you up with experts and 
as I said, not only information and answer questions, but also find more questions to be asked, because really that is a part of this. All right, we like to start every morning with something that we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day, the jargon du jour. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one anagram, and try to figure out not only what it means in general so that we can build our knowledge base, but also to look at it more specifically about what is this, how do we apply this to our individual children? This journey is, as we say a lot, this is not a sprint. No, it is a long haul. Seven years in, (laughs) I can attest to that. And you know, you learn different things at different times. You cannot be expected on day one or even day 101 to know all the things that there are to know. As I said, seven years in and I, there, what I don't know about autism is overwhelming to me. Have I learned some things along the way? Yes. Are there some things I'd like to go back and do over again, knowing what I know now? Yes. Um, and one of those things, and one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about doing jargon of the day is that I wish that instead of being as overwhelmed as I was by jargon in the beginning that I started to learn it a little bit at a time and make friends with it a little bit at a time. So that's what we try to do here is give you one. This is our quick little warm up in the morning where we take on one word, one phrase, one anagram and make sense of it, hopefully, uh, or at least make a start in making sense of it. Okay. So today's word, it's one that we haven't featured before, but It really, as we start the beginning of this year, is a pretty important word. And the word is assessment. Now, this is a word that is very popular nowadays. And if you uh, are in an education setting at all, it's assessment, 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 assessment. This is what they talk about endlessly, assessment. So let's take, and, and especially for our kids on the autism spectrum, we are going to hear this word again and again and again. But really for all kids, you're going to hear it at some point. All right, so let's take a look at what our actual definition. An assessment is the systematic collection, review, and use of relevant information that may be relied on for making decisions about improving student learning and development. Okay, Um, a little wordy, but you know, we can basically understand this. It's like a measuring tool. Let's take a look at our uh, working definition, which is a series of questions that are used to clearly see a child's current abilities and areas of concern. I don't know about you, but I I still want this, but I especially wanted it early on, a snapshot. You know, people say, okay, well, your child has autism, or oh, your child has Asperger's, or oh, your child has PDD-NOS, or oh, your child is behind, um, or oh, your child is having behavior issues. And there seems, you know, we never want to compare, right? Because as we know, normal is just a setting on the dryer, right? But to some extent, you kind of want to get a feel for how behind are we, right? Isn't that the question that most parents want to know? How far behind are we? And I, I know I would always look at my kid and look at other kids. We'd go to a birthday party and I'd go, oh, look at what those, my kid's not doing that. How bad is that? You know, um, and be caught up in a little, one of those habit trail things about, oh, we're behind. And... <clears throat> For most of our kids on the autism spectrum, they are going to be behind in in at least three areas or you're not going to get a diagnosis, right? Um, But wouldn't it be nice, I'm having microphone issues here, wouldn't it be nice to regularly uh, have a really good idea of where you were? a snapshot of here's where we are right now. Eventually you can say, here's where we are, here's where we were, but always you want to say, here's where we're trying to get to. Here's the measuring stick over here. So we do an assessment, we answer questions and you know, all assessments are not created equally. Um, But what's clear is that we want an assessment that has useful relevant information. Uh, I've had to fill out many assessments and I'm sure you guys have too. And if you haven't, you will. (laughs) Rest assured. Uh, There are times when you go to school and they hand out all these papers and, you know, oh, and they ask all these questions and you really need to read the directions uh, because sometimes they're asking you, you know, think of all the times that your child has ever engaged in this behavior and think of the 
the worst time and then measure it to that. Other times they want, want to only want to know, uh, when have you seen this behavior in the last three months? Other times it's, when have you seen this behavior in the last three weeks? Which really makes a difference if you stop and think about it. Because if I think about behaviors that my child ever engaged in, oh, well, that's a different picture than behaviors that he's engaged in the last three weeks. So important to read the instructions of an assessment and really important that you get regular assessments. If, as I said, as I started the conversation where I was talking about in an education setting, you'll hear teachers talk about assessment, assessment, assessment. Um, there's a reason why, because studies have shown that whatever you're doing, if you clearly know where you're starting and you clearly know where you want to get to, um, and you take a snapshot of that, then you can chart a course to figure out how to get there. Stop and think about if you were going to drive cross country and you didn't know where you were starting and you didn't know where you were going, what's the likelihood you're going to get where you're going to go? Not as good, right? Uh, we've all had the experience of looking up directions on a map quest, not knowing where we are and, and not <laughs> being able to figure out. They have a lovely feature now where if you do know where you are, that you can click a button and it wipes that away so that you can start uh, wherever you choose to. But there are times when you don't know where you are. Um, I can remember when I first, after college, moved to New York City and was trying to negotiate the subway system. And I would go down into the tunnel and I might ask somebody, okay, well, you know, I want to get to 14th Street. And they would say, oh, you know, you got to go downtown. <sighs> I don't know where I am. So going downtown you know, wasn't making sense to me. And until I got a feel for, okay, this is, this is where I am. This is where I'm going. I wasn't good at the subway system. Well, if we really want to truly be effective and efficient working with our kids on the spectrum, and let's face it, you know, time is of essence. We really have to know where we are and where we're going. And a really good assessment is going to say to you, this is where your child is at this scale. You know, your child is three years old, but they have the skills of a two-year-old. So, you know, okay, I'm a year behind on this skill. But over here, here's your child on this skill, and your child is a three-year-old, and they're at uh, two years and five months. Okay, I'm not as far behind there. Um, a really good assessment is going to be able to give you that snapshot and help you to make choices about where and how you want to spend your time helping your child. Uh, I, in particular, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in the show, love the assessment that comes in the skills program because it's something that you can do at your own pace. There are a lot of questions, not going to kid you there, but you can do it at your own pace. I think it took me a little over a month to answer all the questions, and I really was able to check in and it showed me my progress. So, you know, you've answered 85% of the questions in this area, you know, and it chunked it down for me in a way that I could handle it. There were times, I'll be honest, when I would go, all right, I'm getting itchy. I can't, <laughs> I got to take a break. Um, and I could, and I could save my work and come back and it was saved for me. Um, and a little bit later, we're going to talk about all the different ways that you can use that assessment. Really worth it. Um, but whatever way you choose to do an assessment, really important. Um, we're talking a lot about goal setting this week. Really important that we know where we are and where we're going to. An assessment, a good assessment is going to do that for us. So when you're at an IEP and they say, we want to assess your child for APE services. Great. Uh, we want to assess your child for this. They're taking a snapshot. They're figuring out where your child currently is and what the areas of concern are. How far behind is the child? Where does the child need to be caught up? Where would we want to start this? Uh, which you can't know unless you know where you are. All right. So that is uh, our jargon term for the day. We also start every morning with a question of the day. And you guys have really already been writing in on this. I uh, really appreciate that. And we're going to be checking in a little bit later to see the kinds of things that you guys answered. But our question is, what goals would you like your child to achieve this year? Um, 
we said on Friday, you know, that Dr. Philism, you got to name it to claim it, right? If you just, if you say to yourself, well, I just want my child to be better, that's lovely. And bless your heart. Of course, we all want our children to make progress. But let's get specific. Let's get specific and then let's get efficient and effective about it. What kinds of areas do you want to see uh, your child make progress? I, My husband and I have already talked about this year for our son. We want to see a jump in social progress um, because my son is at an age where woo, it changed a little bit and I felt like we were a little behind the curve here. So we have to step up our game. There have to be more play dates. There are some very specific things that I've outlined for us that I want him to be working on. And one of them is being able to understand conversation of when to stop, when to continue, how to continue social conversation. We're really going to be working on that big time this year. Um, but what about you guys? What is it that you want to work on? If we name it, we can claim it, right? Um, because the lessons are there. Uh, we know that these things can be taught. We just have to get real clear uh, and use our time efficiently. So we'll check in with you a little bit later, but please write in and let us know. We always have a topic of the week and uh, our topic this week, as I already sort of mentioned, since we're at the beginning of the year and uh, it's time when we talk about uh, goals and about uh, what's that horrible word that I don't like to use <laughs> when uh, when you make resolutions. I don't like to use the word resolutions because it seems like by March everybody's done talking about resolutions and that's you know people who are hardcore are still talking about it in February. A lot of people by now are like uh, yeah what happened to that. Um, but I think when we talk about goals setting short-term and long-term goals um, we can really make a difference. It's amazing how different things can become. So, uh, so important that we set goals for the family, that we set goals for ourselves, that we set goals for our children while we're working on them. Uh, they're going to be different for all of us, just like our kids, just like us. We're all different. But, um, you know, it's those things of, I think it's worthwhile every once in a while to sit and say, okay, if if I could change something, what would I change? That to me is powerful, a powerful, powerful moment because really there's very little in life that most of us cannot change. I realize that across the world there are a lot of things that are outside of people's control, but when you get right down to it, the things... A lot of times the things that we say, oh, I wish I could change this, we have the capability to see that that needle move at least a little bit. And that's a powerful, powerful thing. All right. So some of the different things that we're going to be talking about this week, uh, this today in particular, we have our stress tip because it's Monday. Have to have a stress tip on Monday. Uh, we are going to be going over some ABA basics on Mondays from now on. And we have a special guest. Scott Badish is going to be with us from the Autism Society. And we are going to be featuring them pretty much all this week because it's a wonderful organization organization. Every week we're trying to feature a different organization and let you know where this organization fits into your life, how they can be of use to you, what they're doing, how they've moved the dial and made what you're doing perhaps a little bit easier. So thrilled that we're going to have Scott Badish a little bit later on in the second hour today. And you guys can write in your questions for him or about any of these topics or about anything under the sun. You know that we, we, we make a plan just like we do as parents. We make a plan and then stuff happens. We're a live show and we will chuck things to the side to be able to entertain your questions whenever possible because really that's what this show is about. So I remind all of you that I am not an expert in autism. I'm just somebody who's been on the journey for seven years this week and what a seven years it has been. Uh, I've learned some along the way but not nearly as much so I'm here to learn from you and from our experts as much as anybody else. We appreciate your input. We're going to take a break. When we come back, it's time to talk about stress in the new year and what we can do to help ourselves to uh, set ourselves up for success and achieve the goals that we want. So stick with us back after these messages. You say hi.
Hey, welcome back to Autism Live. We heard you. Everybody wants macaroni and cheese. Yeah, but we're going to make it allergy free. But here's what's the crazy part of this macaroni and cheese it's actually healthy. And it tastes good. Yeah, it tastes that, really that's good. That's the most important part. Yeah. So we're going to start. We got our water boiling. Um, there's so many variations on the pasta. Um, we're using today a corn pasta. We can verify with the manufacturer that we have a GMO free product. So let's go ahead and put that in there. Ooh, yeah. And if you don't mind, stir that sure. up for me, my friend. Now it's sticking a little bit to the bottom. Yeah. Is that okay? We maybe add a little more high heat oil okay. and spread that around again. One thing you gotta know about gluten-free pasta, if you overcook this, it becomes mush. Let's move this guy over to the Swap. other burner so you can see what I'm doing. And now we're gonna start with the old macaroni and cheese sauce. What's great is there's a lot of choices for, um, you know, different soups. And the way that I look at soups, and again, please follow the recipe on uh, your screen right now. I don't like to measure very often. Uh, but what I like to use is a creamy um, butternut squash soup. So this soup is great because it adds a lot of flavor um, to the dish, but also gives people another serving of vegetables. And with kids, we don't want to over season. Maybe with the adults, we can uh, season some for the kids first, pull it out, serve them, and then add a little more you know, garlic powder or onion powder or other types of things into your dish. So the next most important thing on this recipe is we're gonna add in a thickener and the faux cheese. Now some people like their sauce really thick, so you just add in more cornstarch or more arrowroot, so that's not a big deal. How's that doing? You I, think think you're ready? I think it's done. Okay, so why don't we switch? I'll okay. take that, you do that. Okay. And um, I'm going to strain this bad boy here. Here, let me turn that off. Okay. Or we're going to cause trouble again. <laughs> trouble in Lisa's kitchen. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's another show. Don't. Yeah, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead, get this all strained. It's a good consistency. So I'm going to check to make sure our pasta is cooked. So really, you just want to make sure, just like any pasta, it's a little bit squeezy, a little bit. Nice. Dude, good job. Yay. We're good. It looks yummy. So even though the cheese is not totally melted, it's okay, don't panic. What's important is that you're gonna love this recipe once you eat it. Um, what I enjoy most about this recipe is that it's, it smells good, but this That's stuff perfect. is amazing. So if you don't mind, I'm going to serve you some up and you can yeah. maybe blow a little bit on it so you don't burn your mouth. Sorry, I'm once a mom, always a like, mom. Just like, wait till I can't. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, but I can't wait. wait. I'm excited. <laughs> so I'm going to give a shot of this too. But oh my gosh, that is so good. This is the ultimate comfort food. So oh, it's so uh, good. Isn't it good. And I'm not just saying that. <laughs> it is really good. Mmm. It literally tastes like something our kids would really like. And that sweetness is really, really, really good. So the bonus for us is that when we're serving this to our kids, they're actually getting a full serving of vegetables in this. So instead of just eating a bunch of carbs and worthless calories, you're actually getting some good stuff in this. And um, we'll be back next time. I hope you join us again here on Autism Live. We're really loving the feedback. And if you have additional feedback, here's how you get it to us. You can send it to us via email at autismlive at gmail.com. On Facebook, Facebook, mm -hmm. facebook.com slash autism live. And also there's thousands of recipes waiting for you to discover them with pictures and different things on the Taka website. So you can hit Taka on the web, takanow.org, and we'll be back. Hopefully we'll get to do this again. I had so much Maybe fun. Maybe we'll have a little wine, but you got to join <laughs> us next time. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye, guys. We're going to keep eating. Oh. <laughs> we'll say hi, we say hi. Let's get right. Let's get right. Let's get right. And of course, that is the amazing Lisa Ackerman, uh, founder of Taka. Talk about curing autism, an amazing high energy mom and quite the cook. And I've said this before that she came in, uh, I don't know, six months ago and was a guest on the show. And we got to talking because Nancy Allspaw Jackson was here on Wednesdays. Nancy's here with me and does Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. So Lisa came in and afterwards we were sitting here and um, talking and as mom, 
once we started talking about recipes and all three of our kids are on gluten casein, gluten-free casein-free diets. And so it becomes a thing that you talk about. But I think all moms talk about recipes at some point. And uh, Lisa said, oh, shh, this macaroni and cheese, uh, you know, it's life-changing. And I, of course, because we're on an even more restrictive diet than gluten-free casein-free. And I said, oh, I'm sure that we can't have it. And she said, no, 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 no you can have it. And, and she talked about this butternut squash soup. And I said, it's, it's creamy. We can't have it. I'm guaranteeing that we cannot have it. Uh, anyway, long story short, I know too late. Uh, we, they did the cooking segment and I couldn't be there for the cooking segment, but our technical director, Emily Goodwin was there and came back and said, Shannon, this soup, this, uh, the soup that they put into the macaroni and cheese was really fabulous. It was really good macaroni and cheese. And anytime somebody who's not on a gluten-free casein-free diet talks about a food as being really tasty, you know, my ears perk up. In any case, uh, we've tried the soup. We've made the soup. It is uh, we the macaroni and cheese too. The soup is fabulous. Uh, the brand that I use is um, from Imagine. It's organic. It's not inexpensive. I'll be honest with you about that. And it's a little bit addic addictive but really good stuff. And you put a little bit of that in the macaroni and cheese and it helps the, uh, the day of cheese to melt. Ooh, good stuff. Really good stuff. Now I will tell you, we use brown rice, uh, pasta in ours. And one of the keys that I found to cook in the brown rice pasta is that you bring the water to a boil and then you turn the burner off just turn it off and let it soak in the water uh, for the appropriate amount of time, whatever it said in the package to cook it. And it, it you know, plumps up, but it retains its form and it's really good. Uh, so that's my secret with the brown rice pasta. Uh, and I have not tried the garbanzo uh, elbow macaroni. I'm going to have to try that. And I, somebody had written in on our YouTube page about the cornstarch or arrowroot um, that they can't have it and I shared that we haven't been using it. She says that you can use cornstarch or arrowroot and that it's an option anyway if you like it thicker. We have not been using it. I use just a little bit less of the soup and uh, I like ours just slightly runnier anyway and I've been thrilled with the results and not only that my kid loves it. It is comfort food and it's great on these cold days to make that very filling and actually the whole family loves it. So great recipe. Thank you to Lisa Ackerman for no uh, mac and no cheese. Love it. Okay. Um, and again, check out the taco website for more recipes because they really do an amazing job. And they even have, if you're doing GFCF and, and potentially SF, the soy free as well, they have, uh, guides, uh, that you can follow. You still need to check on your own, but places you can eat out, like where you can get gluten-free casein, free pizza, those kinds of things on the taco website. So we love the TACA folks and thank Lisa for doing these segments for us. All right. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about stress, right? It's Monday and it's time to talk about stress. And all this week we're talking about setting goals and how important it is for us to know where we're going, where we want to get to. Um, Unfortunately, though, sometimes when we set goals and we have things that we have to do, and we all know we have things that we have to do, right? There's the things we want to do and the things we have to do. And the have to's weigh on us and add to that feeling of stress and being overwhelmed. And I don't know about you, but on this autism journey, we have enough of that. We don't need to feed into that. So uh, one of the things that we do, and by the way, this happens to our kids too. If we were to sit down and say to our kids, we just talked about assessment. If we were to say, okay, well, you're a year and a half behind or you're four years behind or you're eight years behind. So here are the thousands of lessons that we're going to teach you over the next couple of years. that are going to help you to get caught up. If the child were able to understand that, they would burst into tears. I would want to burst into tears. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's just overwhelming. We don't need to do that. If we know where we're going, great. Um, but we don't need to focus on every step along the way that has to happen, right? Um, so instead, what we do with our kids is that we micro-chunk it down. 
to these little itty bitty, bitty things that we do with our little itty bitty lessons that we teach our children so that after a period of time they are able to piece together those things and they've made progress, substantive progress. Well, if you look at all the experts in all the fields of organization and goal setting and, you know, people who are business coaches and, uh, you know, athletic coaches, they espouse this same technique of doing things in small increments to make real progress. If you hear about organizational experts, they talk about, well, you know, if you have this overwhelming thing, like your garage is a complete and total mess and you want to get your garage under control, you hear the experts talk about how, you know, it's great if you can have somebody from a reality show come and they go through and pull everything out of your garage and they help you to go through it and they cart it all away, right? That's fabulous. And we see that picture and go, oh, that's possible for us. But who really can get that done without having it add stress to them? The experts say that in truth, the best way to get something like that done is to set aside small projects for a small amount of time on a regular basis. That if you spend 10 minutes every day or every other day clearing up one part of the, the garage, what will happen is that after a period of time, so much progress will be made and you'll be so excited about it that then maybe you can take a weekend and bring everything that's left out onto the driveway, sort through it and put everything back um, and have it really be successful. So if we apply this to anything that's stressing us out, this idea of micro chunking it down, how can we take this and put it in smaller amounts? So my question to you right now is what's stressing you out? What's kicking your can right now? What's overwhelming and hanging over you that you're like, I just, can't do it. I had a bunch of paperwork that I just had to do last week and I was so overwhelmed and had been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I finally reminded myself, cause I forget this on a daily basis. This is, I would never do this to my child. I would never sit him down and say, all right, we're going to do these 30 pages of work right now. I would sit him down and say, we're just going to do this one page. And then we're going to go do something really fun to reward ourselves for doing the one page and eventually get the 30 pages done. Um, so what's kicking your can? What's stressing you out? How can you micro chunk it down? What really can you do today? And maybe setting yourself the goal, maybe 10 minutes is an appropriate amount of time to spend on something today. Maybe that's too much. Can you spend four minutes on it. Because I got to be honest with you, there are things that we're willing to do for four minutes that we can't do for 10 minutes right now, right? It's okay. Um, but asking yourself, is there some way that I can move the dial today? Is there something I can do? If it's exercise, you know, instead of saying, well, I'm going to run the mile today, can I walk around the block? Uh, and if that's too much, taking it down even more. Can I go up and down the stairs twice? If that's too much, starting where you are, right? And doing something and committing to doing something on a regular basis. That is what gets it done. That's how you get from point A to point Z. The experts tell us it's true. I know I tend to forget that. <laughs> but I'm reminding me and I'm reminding you. And when we do that, it banishes the overwhelmed. And then you can say to yourself, I did it today and put it to rest. Move on to other things. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be overstressed. Move the dial just a little bit. Uh, I always think about the, the thing of climbing the mountain, you know, when you stand there and you look at Mount Everest and think, how on earth are we going to get there? But if you've ever hiked a mountain, what happens is once you get started, you're seeing what's in front of you. You're not seeing the tip of the mountain anymore. You know, that's where you're going, but you're focused on the things around you and you take it a little bit at a time and eventually you do get there. You really do. Okay. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, it is time for us to look at your answers to the question of the day. We asked you, what are your goals for your children? And we're going to be taking a look at that. So stick with us. DCF and DAC Gallery. Started in 1946, uh, a group of parents had some children that they wanted to engage in productive activities. Want to show us your artwork in the gallery? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, show us, show us. I want to see. 
And the two top ones are yours? Yeah. Very cool. Are you proud of them? Yeah. We actually uh, work with about 150 students and they're all special needs artists. I like working with clay. Clay is my outlet because clay can mold in all kinds of shapes. When they come to the program, they don't realize that the potential that they have of being great artists. And once they work with the professional artists that we have here, you know, they began to discover that they do have talent. When they make that discovery of their talent, and when there are even some that have challenging behaviors, their behavior would change. This is my third year here. This is like home, like home sweet home, like family, friends, They're like family, so uh, I like it here. Some have moved from here to go to college, even get jobs. That's great, and molding them to be the people that they never thought that they would be. Welcome back to Autism Live. We ask you a question every day, and today's question, because we're at the beginning of a new year, was what goals do you have for your child this year? What are some things that you want to achieve that by the time 2014 rolls around that you can say to yourself, done, we did this? Um, and I was sharing earlier that for for our child, we, we really have some social language goals that we're working on big time this year. Um, but I wanted to hear from you guys about what What's on your list? And so somebody tweeted us and said to totally master potty training. What a great goal. And what I love about it is it's totally doable, totally doable. We've had so many ABA experts come in here um, and we have many videos. You can go to our YouTube channel and search and see, you can go to our Facebook and, and search. Um, but they all say the same thing. I mean, lots of different takes on it, right? And our kids are different, but they all say the same same thing. This is doable for our kids on the autism spectrum. That I, I, I ask them all the time, because I don't know about you, when my child faced potty training and there was a little shadow of a doubt in the back of my head that I thought, oh, you know, not a guarantee. And part of the reason why I thought that was when I can remember when we went to go buy big car seats because my child was very tall and we needed to get the move up to the bigger car seat seat and he had just been diagnosed and I was buying one of the car seats and the girl who worked in the store uh, said something about autism because I had mentioned that we just had gotten diagnosed and uh, and she said oh you know um, I've got a friend who has a child on the spectrum and he's 15 now and he's just doing so great and I you know like homing beacon I was like right in her face going what does that mean that he's doing great what you know what kind of an outcome well you know he's 15 years old and he's just he's just really doing great he's still in diapers but and it was as though I felt my stomach fall through my body through the floor and go right to the core of the earth that the fact that she thought you know this is the definition of doing great that he's 15 years old and he's still in diapers ah, um, you know, and it was one of the first things that I heard really was devastating to me. So when Center for Autism and Related Disorders started working with my son at the age of three uh, and, and they said, you know, well, we're going to take on potty training and it's going to be really quick and we're going to get this under control. Um, there was a part of me that I, you know, I was concerned, like, is this possible? Is this really something that we could do because, uh, or am I going to be the mom at 15 who's changing diapers? And what I hear, and they were able to potty train my son very quickly. Uh, and what I hear all the time from them is this is something we love to do because we know hundred percent success rate. 100%. And I ask them all the time, but aren't there some kids, isn't there a possibility that there's a child that isn't going to learn potty training? And they all say, no, we know how to do this. This, we absolutely, it, you know, we know how to do this. There's going to be different considerations for different kids. Some kids are going to take a little bit longer, but relatively, this is one of the easy things uh, we can get this done. So great, great goal for 2013. And I hope you check out what our experts have had to say about it um, because very doable. Uh, another person says eating food other than just Cheetos. Oh yes, that's a good goal to have too because uh, I'm not sure of the nutritive co content of Cheetos, but I'm just going to guess uh, that it's not what we want as parents. So absolutely, we can get more variety in all of our kids' diets. I would encourage you since 
orange is a color that your child likes, check out that macaroni and no cheese recipe to see uh, if they'll like it. Okay, uh, another person who says more language skills. I'm right there with you. Uh, really, really important. Somebody else who says happy, healthy, and do good in school. There we go. That's really good. Uh, somebody else who says to be able to tell me what is wrong when she's crying. Uh, you know what? And I really appreciate where you're coming from. We just went through, my son just had the flu, and I remember the years that when he was sick and I, and I would cry and say, I just wish he could tell me. Uh, I will tell you that now he can tell me, and it's a different thing. I mean, it's really, uh, it's not the freedom that I thought it was going to be because when they're upset and when they're crying and when they don't feel good, um, yes, when you know what it is, then there are, you know, you can move forward and know which symptom to treat. But I got to be honest with you, it doesn't change the pit in your stomach. Um, but I, I do hope that this year she's going to be able to tell you what's wrong when she's crying. Uh, another person who says master communication skills verbally, love that. Uh, somebody who says recover him so he will not suffer anymore. Um, and of course, recovery is a word that we do use here. I know it means different things to different people, but there is such a thing as recovery from autism because there are children who have been tested, who come up on the autism spectrum, who meet the criteria, and then after a period of time, after intensive, intensive services, no longer qualify for that autism diagnosis. And that is a word that we use, recovery. Um, and I do know that not all kids on the autism spectrum, not all adults on the autism spectrum would like the word suffer. There are kids who do suffer. And and there are kids who do not. Um, but I appreciate the fact that you're saying that your child is suffering. And I hope that for you that that ends as well. Uh, and another person who, person after my own heart, how to have a conversation. Boy, there's so many aspects to conversation. And I'm really learning at this stage in the game that in fourth grade, it changes. It really changed in third grade. And I was a little slow on the uptake. Um, and you know, some of the nuances of what starts to happen at this age, ooh, caught me a little off guard. Uh, but mastering conversation, wow, really, really intensive. Uh, so that was just one of the sites. And maybe we'll, if we have time a little bit later on, we'll check back in to see some more things that you guys have said about goals that you have for your child. But so important, you gotta name it to claim it, right? Uh, we're gonna take a break. And when we come back, we're gonna go back to square one and talk a little bit about ABA basics. And in particular, we're gonna talk about positive and negative reinforcement, because this is an area where I get a little confused from time to time and maybe you do too. So stick with us, keep your comments coming in and we'll be back after these messages. Monica Holloway is a critically acclaimed author, speaker and activist. She is also an autism mom. Her son Wills was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. Now at the age of 15, Wills is a high school freshman attending a mainstream school. I'm in a brand new school. I'm in a great school that I love, and I'm really happy there. I made friends pretty quickly on the first day, uh -huh. and something interesting happened to me on the first day. Tell me. We were doing an art project with um, fabric markers, and there was a little label on it that said, squeeze for best results. Okay. And so I squeezed it and exploded. <laughs> all over the people at my table. Oh no! And they were all covered in little blue dots. I asked Wills, how he describes autism to people. I say that I have Asperger's syndrome, which is a slight form of autism. It doesn't make you any different. It really doesn't. It's just, it's just there and it just kind of makes you who you are. I asked Wills what he thought of the Sandy Hook shooter's actions being linked to autism. Please, please just don't, don't be scared of autism. If, you, if somebody has autism, don't be scared of them. Chances are they're not violent. They're just like you or me. Monica is a proud mom with good cause. I asked her to describe Wills in five words. Generous, curious, funny, sensitive, loving. We had a chance to talk about the Sandy Hook massacre and how Monica heard the news. 
On Friday, when it happened, when the shooting happened in Connecticut, I was in my car, and uh, my husband Michael called to tell me what had happened, and I was in a state of shock, as I think we all were, but that many children, and I felt, I guess, a mind can't take in that kind of information uh, without feeling nauseous. I, I felt it go from here all the way down my body. I started calling everybody I knew to tell them I loved them and um, I was thinking about them and I just wanted to be with the people that I knew. I started hearing more and more um, information come on the news about this shooter having Asperger's or being autistic. And then I started hearing things about, um, well, does autism cause violence? And I started, to, I was in a whole other level of shock. Never in a million years would I think that somebody might associate us and my son's face with the face of violence just because he has Asperger's. And I've seen bad days and good days and that's what kills me is like there was not a day bad enough to ever make me think that he or any of his friends could ever be violent. The only thing that made me even feel a little bit better to do something to help educate and so we have started a campaign on my Facebook page Cowboy and Wills it's called I am the face of autism and please post a picture of yourself it can be your child your friend with autism let's put these beautiful faces of these people with autism on to wipe out the face of this murderer let's put our faces in front of his Welcome back. That was Monica Holloway and her son, Wills. What an amazing woman. If you have not read Cowboy and Wills, oh my goodness, treat yourself and read that book. I, and I, I encourage people who don't have a child on the autism spectrum to read it because it's hilarious. And I'm very fussy about books and especially books that I read about autism. And I am not somebody who laughs out loud at books very often. I think there are a total of maybe four books in my life that I have laughed out loud and Cowboy and Bill, Cowboy and Wills was one of them. So really, really funny, very poignant. You know, it's that thing I laughed at, cried, it was better than cats. It really was because it's about a dog. And um, not that there's anything wrong with cats, but uh, really, really great book and an amazing woman. And Wills, oh my goodness, I can't wait. I, I want my son to meet him. What a role model he is. Absolutely fabulous. So check out Cowboy and Wills and also check out their Facebook and post pictures of your kids. We need to turn this around a little bit and have the face of autism um, be what what our kids are, which is amazing. Uh, so check out their Facebook, post your child, post your child's story, and add to this face of autism. Also, we were talking about the question of the day, and somebody wrote in, and um, I'm just going to mark this question, uh, but uh, somebody wrote in and said that their number one goal for this year is a buddy for their son in school. This is a really important goal for uh, for all of us to have, and it kind of goes hand in hand with we're about to talk about ABA for beginners. Um, and I said that we were gonna focus a little bit uh, today on positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, because those, those are very confusing, <laughs> and they have the potential to be very confusing. So what is positive reinforcement? Positive reinforcement is something that you Add to something that makes it more likely that the thing is going to happen again. So for instance, having a buddy at school is very potentially positive reinforcement. It's something you're adding to the situation that's going on and it's going to make it more likely that the child engages in the behaviors that they want. So if what, if what we want is the child to be more social at school, having a buddy at school very likely could be positive reinforcement because uh, the child will enjoy having that buddy there and be more likely to open up and be social social in school. So that's positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement can take on many different aspects. But what's important to note is that sometimes we think something is going to be reinforcing and it's not. Uh, right? That we don't really know if it's reinforcing until we see if it increased the behavior. 
And if it does increase the behavior, then it actually is reinforcing. Now, this is not only true of our kids on the autism spectrum, this is true of us as well. How, and our goal setting, which we're talking about all this week long, how many times, I'm guilty as charged, have I thought to myself, I'm going to exercise more and I know that I need to have some sort of positive reinforcement, so I'm going to give myself the reinforcement that after I exercise, this and that and so can happen, right? Whatever it is that I, you know, get to have some treat of some sort, which could be a food thing or time off or whatever it is, right? And then, and I promise myself that and I'm delivering it, but it doesn't make my exercising happen more often. Therefore, what we can look at and say afterwards is whatever it was that I offered myself for a treat was not reinforcing enough to get the job done right? We see this happen with our kids all the time, that we think that something is reinforcing enough and yet it doesn't actually make the behavior occur more often, therefore it is not reinforcing enough. Maybe it's reinforcing slightly, but it's not reinforcing enough. So we always have to look backwards a little bit. Did it get the job done? Was it reinforcing enough? And in the moment we want to be thinking to ourselves, okay, I want my child to do this behavior. What how could I reinforce that so that it would be more likely for it to happen more often? Okay, so what's negative reinforcement? I think a lot of us before ABA training assume, okay, well, that must be punishment, right? No. Negative re reinforcement is when you take something away. And by taking something away, it makes it more likely for the behavior to happen. So if your child is trying to concentrate and they're doing their math problems and the TV is on, right, it's making it harder for them to do their math homework. And so if we t turn that television off, we're taking something away. The noise of the television and the child finishes the homework, then so that's negative reinforcement. Now, could be a sibling standing screaming in the kitchen while the child's trying to do their homework, right? Um, or something that sensory-wise your child just doesn't like. For some kids, having a fluorescent light on overhead makes it more difficult for them to focus. So negative reinforcement would be turning that light off. And we see that the child, oh, you know, takes a breath and finishes. Um, and so that's negative reinforcement, taking something away. A little confusing to me. Uh, so I don't know if it's confusing to you. But but it really is important that we find ways to reinforce our kids. And when we reinforce them, we're making it more likely that they engage in the behavior that we're looking for. That's the key. That's what's really important. But can we also apply this to ourselves? You betcha. So asking yourself, if I have a goal, what my goal is, what are the little steps along the way, and what would be reinforcing to me to make that happen? Uh, all really important steps along the way. All right, we are going to take a break, and when we come back, we've got some more exciting stuff to talk about, in particular, some things that happen in the news. I want to talk about the Miss Merrick pageant, so stick with us. Welcome back everyone. It's the beginning of a new year, which means the possibilities for new beginnings and starting new traditions. So I figured for the month of January, we should make a calendar for our kids to use. The focus of this project will happen with your children after it's completed. All you need to do to make the calendar is to go to facebook.com slash autism live to download the template I've already made for you guys. And then the other materials you'll be needing are a scissors and some magnets which is super easy to find at your local craft store. Once you have your printed templates and you have your magnets, all you have to do is just take the paper and then assemble it onto the magnet. It's super easy. And then cut out all the shapes. That part is a little bit more tedious, but once you have that done, you're gonna have a calendar that you can use all year round for years to come. So let's get to it. Why is this calendar so cool? Well, first thing, it's that everything is completely modular, like I said before, so you can have your kids practice naming the days of the week and putting them in order. You can even ask them questions like, what month comes after January, for instance? Other things you can do with your child is having them, you know, label the different seasons and then assigning the seasons to the correct months. So there's different ways you can use this based on your child's skill level. And what's cool about this calendar is as your child grows, so is the use value of this magnet calendar because 
you can focus on more abstract things with your kid as they develop and work on simpler things with them when they first start working with it. And this is something you can always do every day of the week because the days change, right? So there's always an opportunity to visit the calendar and to use it in your daily lives. And these are just a few examples of the kind of activities you can do while playing with the magnet calendar. I hope you enjoy this activity and I look forward to seeing you next month. Until then, craft on. Can you see me flying by your side? Gotta love that Smarty. I can't wait to do that calendar. We haven't had a second to do it yet, but absolutely love it. And those templates are available um, to you as well. So check those out. I pinned it today on Pinterest. If you're not on Pinterest, um, you can also find that on our Facebook. Uh, all right. Wanted to talk a little bit about in the news because if you saw the Miss America pageant, of course, it was the 92nd Miss America pageant this Saturday that was on ABC television. And like a lot of you, I was glued to the, the couch and very excited about the whole thing because we had our first ever diagnosed contestant diagnosed with autism. Um, of course, I'm talking about Alexis Weinman, who was Miss Montana, who has a diagnosis of asthma burgers and was so excited for her. She was the youngest person in the pageant and uh, got a lot of attention, a lot of interviews that were happening for her, big time interviews um, before the pageant, uh, a lot of fuss and, and excitement around her being in the pageant. And we mentioned on Friday that also the Quality of Life Award was given on Thursday. That was given to Miss Alabama, whose platform, and by the way, her name was Anna Laura Bryan. And she got that award, a $6,000 scholarship, by the way, so no small thing, right, for her platform, which was PAWS, which is people and animals working side by side and with a focus on animals for autism, so PAWS for autism. So it was really shaping up to be this amazing year talking about um, being differently abled, right? And that was very exciting to me. And we, we sat and watched. And of course, they started the pageant and were very excited, waiting for Miss Montana. Saw her. She looked great. And then almost the first thing that they did was that they gave out, uh, I don't know if they'd done this before, but um, instead of cutting it down to the, the top 10, they were cutting it down to the top 14. And it was decided that the judges would pick 13, that America would vote and pick the 14th person, and you could have voted all week long, and apparently you did. Um, and then they gave the judges one more person, so they went to the top 15, and then those girls competed in the swimsuit competition. And then they whittled it down from there. Okay, so it got to the moment where they were going to announce who was America's choice, and... Wait for it. It was Miss Montana. I, I'm going to like well up now because it was such a moment in our household. I just screamed and, I, you know, you would have thought I was at a football game. Uh, I was so, so very excited. And then I welled up. I got, I got really emotional. I'm getting emotional now because it was such a moment. Um, it was such a moment for her. And I, I think it was such a moment for all of us as parents to feel like, you know, people are paying attention. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes it feels like we're in this little vacuum and, and we have all these kids and more adding that nobody's paying attention. It was just a moment when I thought, wow, everybody sort of rallied together and realized that this young woman uh, has more going on than nail polish, right? And it was very, very exciting. So thrilled for her. She was so thrilled. And you can imagine, you know, I mean, this is a, a young girl who's putting herself out there in a live show. And they were sticking a microphone in her face and asking her questions about how she felt. She was very eloquent about it uh, and very excited to go put on her swimsuit. And then they announced the other girls in the top 14, ultimately 15. And it was not without notice that the Miss Alabama, who was the pause for autism, was in that top 14 as well. And then additionally, in that top 15 was Miss Iowa, whose name was Mar Mariah Carey, not to be mistaken for Mariah Carey, right? Who, uh, it, 
was disclosed that she had overcome Tourette's. So I don't know about you, but it was just this moment of take a look at this pageant and how representative this is of the fact that we are all different. I was very proud of them uh, in that moment, all of them, uh, the judges and everybody involved. I was very, very happy for them. So they went away, they came back and they did the swimsuit competition and, you know, I I'll be honest with you, I think it's one of the cheesier parts of the pageant. It's not my favorite thing. Uh, but they did that, and already a clear fav favorite was emerging, Miss New York, who, uh, you know, in everything that she did and said was very funny and very upbeat. And um, in any case, uh, Alexis Weinman did not make it past the uh, swimsuit competition. She didn't make it to the, the ballroom gown section, which I I was sad about, uh, but I was thrilled for her that she had gotten America's vote. I thought that was really, really a lovely thing. And ultimately, uh, Miss Alabama, the pause for autism, did not make it to the top five, but Miss Iowa came in fourth, the young woman who had overcome Tourette's. And I thought that was really amazing. And she uh, was certainly very thrilled. And Miss New York won. And she was lovely and funny and and uh i think surprised by it all and not not your cookie cutter miss america which i happen to really love uh, so there you have it i thought it was really uh a lovely lovely presentation and left me feeling very hopeful about the image that we project for young women uh, and as I said on Friday, Alexis Weinman's platform was normal. It's just a setting on the dryer. And I think we really saw that in the way the pageant looked at things. So hooray for Miss America. I'm surprised they don't do the Burt Parks thing anymore. I guess it's been years since I've watched, but they don't sing the little song. Um, and there was a very short runway, but it was all very, very exciting for those women. In any case, it's time for us to uh, watch the A word. This, I got all the clumped here. Uh, the A Word is an amazing documentary that's being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a little boy, Jack Riley. At this point in the series, he's only like two, two and a half. In real life, he's now four and making great, great progress. Uh, but this is at the beginning of ABA, and uh, we see that while we're making progress, that there, sometimes it's one step forward and two steps back. That's not unusual, but you always gain back uh, the things when you take a couple of steps back. There are things that you have to tweak. It, like in anything, you have to notice you set your goal and say, are we on course? No, we got to change this. Uh, we're not on course. Oh, we're on course. Changing this. So let's drop in and see what's happening with Jack Riley this week. This is the A word. Jack Riley. Jack Riley, say hi, mommy. Hi, mommy. Turn and look at me when you say hi, mommy. Hi, mommy. Yeah. <laughs> Good try. Hi, everybody. 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 Hi, what are you going to pick? Fourth of July, we were out swimming with an well, you play with? family out there, and he pushed a little girl in the pool. A little three-year-old. Was he playing? Or well, yeah, she was She was jumping in, and there was the steps, and her dad was watching. She'd jump in and sort of paddle to the steps, and she kept doing it. And he was laughing, and she was laughing, and then he just helped her. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, malicious. But yeah, he wasn't angry. I think it was just like... And they did it again, though, after we, uh, so we took him in. You want a cracker? We'll come and get it. There are two skills being displayed by Jack Riley right now. One is that he made eye contact, and the other is independently requesting an item without any prompting. These are both skills that he and his parents and therapists have been working on. Can you say, I want a cracker? Want cracker. Can you say, I want a cracker? <laughs> Cheryl is prompting Jack Riley to use more than one word for his request to build on his vocal skills. When Jack Riley began services three months ago, he was non-vocal with very little verbal skills. To be verbal is to communicate, whether it's with a gesture 
or signing or using pictures, for example. To be vocal is to communicate with audible words. So if you had to pick maybe like your top three things to work on like when you're out in a community. Trying to figure out what will make him compliant, you know, in public when there's a lot of people. He kind of took off twice for the street. It's inconsistent enough that you can't count on it. He, there's days that are great and days where he just, he does one of the... Or he'll say go. <laughs> yeah, go. He says stop and he says go and starts up again. Okay. Him staying with us, him even just walking hand in hand without, okay. uh, I'd say within fewer than 10 steps, he goes noodle and sits down. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a nine hey. section in here. Hey. And then if we can, if you want whatever is, works for you guys, at least if we can do it at least once a week. Hey. These guys go on an outing to wherever you guys normally go. Just to start getting him used to that because it seems that yeah, with the activity everything changes a little bit from him just gets so excited and that that's when I think most reason stops for him and most of what he learns sort of goes out the window yeah. okay we're gonna spiral down spiral 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 <laughs> yay uh, oh to me he sounds like he's talking more than before I don't know that's what I observed hey. huh you're talking a whole lot today do you want to play with your trains? Yes. Good. Okay, should we open? Open. Okay, say open, please. But the fact that he is actually communicating is really, really cool. And they're actually words instead of just, you know, um, utterances or, you know, gestures. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible. 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 Right, say, let's go. Let's go. Okay. Choo choo, come on. Right there, Jack Riley independently began playing with his train appropriately. What you see is what a typically developing kid would do, naturally. But kids with autism, most skills need to be taught until the behavior becomes natural. At this age, half of the ABA therapy occurs while the child is playing. The other half is in a structured environment and at the table, like you've seen in other episodes. You know the train station? Twice. Station. That's a hard word. Do you want it? Yes. Okay, here we go. Wow, yes, are very good. They are. <laughs> oh, and um, for NBI, we're also doing um, two-step actions within play. So, like, basically, whatever it is he's playing with, um, we just have to do two-step actions, and he has to be able to imitate whatever we do. Do this. Choo-choo. You do it. This will help generalize when he goes to preschool because other kids will, you know, be playing with trains too and children naturally just imitate each other. Right now, Jessica and Jack Riley are practicing using yes and no appropriately. Do you want the shoe? Yes. Okay, here you go. Yes. Say no. No. Good. Stop. Put your fingers. Do you want the shoe? Say no. No. Good. So do you want the shoe? No. Okay. Do you want the ball toy? Yes. Okay, here you go. Ball toy. Here, here you go. <laughs> All right, it's over. Okay, here. Do you want a diaper? Yes. No. No. Okay, do you want a diaper? No. Okay, do you want a ball toy? No. No? Do you want the cars? No. No. Do you want a Nemo car? No. Okay. Do you want bubbles? No. No? Yes. Yes? Okay. Bubble puppy. Okay. 
Papa, 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 Hi, can you sit up though? Sit up. Stand up. Ready? Sit. We have new snacks for him because we started to incorporate gluten yesterday. So I've got uh, some stuff. Oh, okay, that he great. Hasn't had in a long time. We tried like putting cut up bananas on his pancake plate okay. last week and not so well. He just threw them down. So I thought like that kind of stuff would be easier now because he's been doing so well and he's not. Uh... So we're still going to have to have the battles. And I think we're just so happy to be done with the battle, the first battle, that we're sort of reluctant to start a new yeah, one, yeah. which is to start introducing new foods. Yeah. But the cool thing is now that we're taking them off of the GFCF stuff, yeah, we have more easier. things to introduce them to. Yeah. And maybe he'll just get less anxious if we're giving him things that he used to love this stuff, but we took him off of it. He won't remember, but maybe it won't be such a big deal if some of the new foods he's getting are things that he's loving. You want to try a cereal bar? Ooh, yummy. Are you looking funny? Oh, Jack Riley. Look better. Do you want to try cereal bar? Cereal bar. Cereal bar, good talking. Cereal bar. You want to try? Cereal bar. Cereal bar. Okay. You want to try? Cereal bar. You want to try? Yeah. You used to love these. So yummy. You want cereal bar? I see. Mommy? Bobby. I want. I want cereal bar. Good job. That was, a good that was very clear. Yeah. Cereal bar. He sees it. So the more subtle we can get of it. Cereal bar. Do you want more? More. Can you say I want more cereal bar? Cereal bar. I. I. Want. What? More. Bar. Cereal bar. Good job. Cereal bar. Yeah. Cereal bar. It is a cereal. That's your new favorite word. You have a new favorite, don't you? Cereal bar. <laughs> Who's here? Who's here? Tell, tell Daddy what you just ate. What did you just eat? Did you eat something? What did you eat, Jack? Tell Daddy. Goldfish. Goldfish. Goldfish? Goldfish? Now what else did you have? Anything else? What else did you have? What else did you eat, Jack? Seal bar. What is it? Good, that's answering so the question like she asked me to do that. What is it? Seal bar. A Nutri-Grain bar. So you you ate a Nutri-Grain bar? And the fact that he turned to Daddy to say that too, that was big. Just right there, did you catch it on camera, Susan? Yeah, I did. It? That did was really, I don't, and it was so nice. And he just answered questions about the past <laughs> to you. About what? He just answered questions about the past, like he never. That's true. The doctor really? last week asked if he could do that. Okay, I'm not going anywhere, I'm just right here. Right here. <laughs> the reason Cheryl is excited about Jack Riley answering Mike's question is that he was able to understand what he said and could recall what he had done in the past without any cues in front of him to remind him. Recalling something in your mind is a complex skill. This is a big leap. It means he grasps language. Welcome back. So that is The A Word and a really amazing documentary. You can watch all of the episodes on their YouTube channel and get caught up. You can go back to the beginning. You can get caught up to where he is now. By the way, I know we were talking about potty training earlier and there is uh, there are a couple of episodes about potty training that are really informative and uh, great to watch. So you can catch up with Jack Riley um, and really get a great overview of ABA. There are a couple of things that I want to talk about. Did you see uh, the time that they were spending teaching him yes and no? And it's a little heartbreaking, right? Because, you know, sitting there and saying, well, you know, do you want the shoe? And he says yes, right? And he gets into a rut of saying yes to everything, even when it's not something he really particularly cares about, and saying no to things that he wants. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a little bit hard to watch because you go, oh, it's just heartbreaking. But you see that he makes progress, that if he, he sees over time, okay, well, if I say yes and then I get it, so I want to say yes to the things that I want and no to the things that I don't. Um, and they're encouraging him to shake his head and, and you know, because that's an important component of this as well, saying yes and shaking your head yes or shaking your head no. That was a really tough one for my son. He could get the yes and the no, but the shaking the head, 
you know, uh, and it's still, there are times he doesn't trust himself because if you, if you, he asks you something and you just shake your head, he says, are you saying no? He wants to check and make sure because it's left over from that period of time. In any case, uh, so important that, you know, it's like stringing the beads one at a time, adding it into it so that by now Jack Riley totally gets yes and no. And it's not something he has to continue working on, but they had to start there and assess showed clearly that you know that was a place that he needed to work um, also want to note the whole idea of him because language has started to grow for him at this point he his working memory and episodic memory they're starting to take form and they're exercising it too and mom is so excited there at the end of the video because he's remembering he's not only understanding his receptive language has gone up exponentially um, but he's also able to remember what he did and and voice what the correct response is I I find it really fascinating when you talk to young adults and adults um, that were on the spectrum when they were kids and you ask them what do you remember about therapy and they're they don't remember a great deal about it and there was one young man that I talked to who had recovered from autism and I said you know, I'm concerned about what my son is going to remember and if he's going to think that his childhood was not, you know, uh, a normal childhood because he didn't, you know, go outside and play the way other kids did. He constantly had adults working with him and going through these different things. What's he going to remember? And this young man said to me, I don't have much memory about that time. You know why? Because I didn't have language. And until we have language, it's much harder. If you've seen Temple Grandin and she talks about how her brain works and she sees things in pictures and it's sort of like Google image and that she classifies things in different groups um, that you know and if a child doesn't have a way to language how they're classifying them it's much harder to go through so that once our kids start to have language the working memory and the episodic memory and the spatial memory all start to come into play and we see them start to cohese and if they don't we have ways of exercising those muscles but we see that Jack Riley is starting to be able to remember and use that memory uh, to be able to add to the conversations. It's really very exciting. And, and another example of how when you take one thing in this area and you're working on it, that it has effects on lots of other areas. Really quite brilliant the way that works. So I hope you'll check out the A Word. We'll continue to watch uh, every day. We, we show an episode and talk about it a little bit. Um, and as I mentioned, you can watch much further ahead to see how Jack Riley is doing now. He just turned four. Amazing how time flies. In any case, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by Scott Baddish. He he is from Autism Society, and he's the president of the Autism Society, and we're going to be talking about this important organization, what it does, and how it might be of use to you on your journey through autism. So stick with us more with Scott Baddish when we come back. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism, my beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're going to take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grandpiche and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement, and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? 
Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, um, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some gases? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work. And seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit, and um, CARD's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to, you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have CARD, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are featuring a very special organization this week, Autism Society. And we have a very special guest joining us via Skype, Scott Badish, who is the president of the Autism Society. Scott, are you there? Yes, I am. So thrilled to have you here today and so thrilled to be talking about this wonderful organization. For people who aren't familiar with what the Autism Society is, fill us in a little bit on what it is that you guys do and what your mission is. Sure. The Autism Society of America is actually the oldest national autism organization. We were founded in 1965 by a group of parents who, at the time, um, when they found out their child had autism, uh, were denied even access to a public education for their child. Uh, since that time, we have grown to be the nation's largest grassroots organization. We serve over a million people a year. Um, we have 107 affiliates throughout the country, um, and our overall mission is to help people who have autism today by increasing their ability and maximizing their ability to uh, be self-sufficient and independent and, um, and, and, and have a high quality of life uh, with a high level of dignity. So unlike some other organizations nationally, we're helping people today who have autism uh, advance through a positive future. Well, and I think it's a lovely, lovely mission, and, and you certainly are a large organization, as you said, what, 105 different? 107, 107 affiliates, both, you know, including that number of state and local affiliates, yes. Okay, and, um, and again, started by parents, which is a really wonderful thing, so you've got a great pedigree. Um, and for people who don't know, who are sitting there and thinking, okay, uh, it's, we certainly have seen the logo, but how is it that they can access you and learn more about what it is exactly that you guys do? Well, since this is Skype, they're hearing that the best way is to go to our uh, website at www.autism-society.org. And we've got it up, actually up on the screen for them as well, so they're getting a visual as well. <laughs> uh, and, and, and our website um, could also hook, uh, they, could, they could find out information about uh, if there's a local uh, Autism Society affiliate in their community. Uh, we also have what's called Autism Source, the nation's largest database of information and referral sources for uh, help with people uh, who need assistance and support. Um, and they also could call our contact number, and the phone number is, in, is on our website, um, where we have um, seven-day-a-week, um, from 9 in the morning to 9 at night uh, Eastern Time, 
uh, except on the weekends we go from nine to six o'clock Eastern time where we have uh, operators and trained uh, staff uh, answering calls and uh, helping people uh, with their journey on autism. Um, right. Again, and again, we serve, you know, we're proud that we are uh, very strong in helping families, helping professionals, and particularly helping individuals who live with autism. Great. And, and you are now the president of the Autism Society of America, is that correct? Yes, that is. And what are your credentials? Why did this become uh, the job that you're currently filling? What, what, what uniquely qualifies you for this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're an autism parent. I do know that. He's 26. He today is starting his second semester at Marshall University. Wow. Major um, in history. Um, and um, my, my experience was actually, I've always been involved with nonprofits, but I was involved with the United Way for over 25 years. And um, I, I just felt that um, I, I could add some value to the autism discussion and helping improve life uh, with people, for people with autism. I saw what my son went through. I saw what my wife and I and, and uh, my ch other children went through in, in, in our journey with Evan. And um, just decided that if I could make life a little simpler and a little easier for people, that would be great. I also saw that uh, so many services that are provided through government and others are, are very well-meaning, but they're not provided in a way that uh, really aims to uh, say, how are we going to improve someone's life? You know, how how is this service going to help this, this individual uh, be more self-sufficient, be more independent? Uh, uh, how do we get there? So I, uh, I thought I could add that, and I was blessed to be asked uh, two years ago almost to be the president of this organization, which uh, to me is the highlight of my career. Well, it's absolutely wonderful. And I want to talk more about those individual services. We're going to take a short break. But when we come back, I'm going to ask you to talk about specific programs that you guys have and some excuse me, specific ways in which you, you, you know, you talk about the people who you serve and let's get down to the nitty gritty about how you serve and, and, and some of the wonderful things that you guys have going on because it really is exemplary and I want people to know about that. But we're going to take a short break and we're going to be back more with Scott Badish from the Autism Society of America after these messages. The Autism Society exists to improve the lives of all affected by autism. We work to increase public awareness about the day-to-day -day issues faced by people on the spectrum, advocate for appropriate services for individuals across their lifespan, and provide the latest information regarding treatment, education, research, and advocacy. For more information, visit www.autismsociety.org. Welcome back. We're here right now with Scott Badish, president of the Autism Society of America. And we were talking before the break about some of the different services. Uh, and you had mentioned several times that the people you serve, you're very interested in helping the people you serve. And how exactly, because there's many different ways that you guys uh, provide services, what exactly do you do? And, and give us some specific examples so that people can know how they might get uh, some help and support from your organization? We, uh, the first thing is that behind all our services and everything we do is a strong respect for the dignity of the individual who, who has autism. And everything we do is aimed at educating to the best we can uh, the parent, the individual, the professional, so that they make the decision that's best for them. So you will never see us saying, uh, this is the best service for your son or daughter or, or you as an individual. We'll say, here's what's available, here's the pluses and minuses, but at the end of the day, you decide. Yeah. And to that end, we, we a key service we provide both on a national level and at all our affiliates is the ability of provision of information. Um, anywhere from a parent who learned this morning that their child was diagnosed with autism, to a, uh, a older adult who has a son who's an adult, um, and the older adult that the parent can no longer care for their son. How do we help them? So we do a tremendous amount of talking to people, helping them understand autism, understand the service system, um, and we also are dealing with crisis. When a family's in crisis, how do we help them um, so that they can get out of crisis, but also how they uh, don't get put in crisis again. We also help a lot with transition. Um, we all know that in everyone's life, including the life of a person with autism, there are stages of autism uh, from from you know from birth to getting to high school, to getting to elementary school, to get to middle school, high school, and life beyond that. 
So we're helping people prepare for that. We do a lot of support programs uh, where parents sit around, uh, professionals sit around, individuals with autism sit around and see that there's this community that's out there to help them. Uh, we have a national conference that's the largest uh, national autism conference in the nation where uh, all those individuals could come and, and learn uh, new ways to do things, learn the newest uh, research that's out there as far as treatment and services. And then we also do a tremendous amount of advocacy, uh, both at the local, I mean, both at the state and national level, uh, advocating for the needs of those we serve, uh, trying to make uh, life better, easier, more dignified for every person we serve. Um, and, and I guess the last thing we would do is is we, te we try to create an environment in this community that it's okay to be autistic. Uh, that's a new the tagline we, we're going to be coming out with soon that suggests that, um, you know, that, that having autism, having a child with autism, it's okay. We'll get people through it. But more importantly, there's such high value in the life of a person with autism, and we want to celebrate that. So we do a lot of the promotion of a positive image of people with autism in this country. Which is really important right now. I, you know, I know we were all devastated by some of the events that happened at the end of the last year, and uh, there were a lot of questions were raised about the face of autism and what autism means. And, and I think it's really important to all of us to get quality information out there and to see that autism is not something to be afraid of uh, or to have any kind of a negative attachment to. Uh, and I, I'm sure that, you know, uh, you guys uh, were devastated by some of the things that happened. You're uh, an East Coast kind of person. And uh, <laughs> and uh, it's it, w the news was shocking and dismaying how it was being linked with autism. Uh, so I appreciate that you're working hard to put a different face on autism as well. Um, I want to go back and talk a little bit about, because so many people, Scott, when they are on this journey, they find themselves at some point feeling as if they are completely alone. And, um, and you really uh, provide information in a format um, and support in a format that pretty much anybody could access. So for, for somebody who's feeling alone and we gave out the website and we'll give it out again, if somebody calls into that number, what kind of help and support can they expect? It's just, the, 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 I think you hit the best thing. Uh, that they're not alone. Yeah. That will help them. We may not be able to answer their question the way they would hope we could answer it, but um, what we try to do is when someone calls us for the first time, we like that call to be the first call of a long relationship. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I met on a blind date 30 years ago, <laughs> 31 years ago. And that first call was how I always, you know, started a relationship that's lifelong. Yeah. And we'll on until we both die. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what we want the call to be here, that that we're here. And you may not call us every day. You may not call us every year. But when you need help, we're going to be there for you. And the second thing is that for the person that's alone, both as an individual with autism, a parent, uh, a brother or a sister, we want we want to make sure that they know they have a friend in us, that we're, we're not going to be someone who says they're doing something right or wrong. We're not going to be judgmental, but we're going to respect their dignity more than anything else. And we want that person to know that when they, they interact with one of our affiliates, uh, it's going to be like going to a social group with friends, um, that, that they will see that uh, there are others who have gone through what they went through, that they're not alone in this journey, that others will help them. Uh, others will hold their hands. But uh, when you, when you, we do surveys and research on our call center, and, and almost everyone says beyond the, the ability of answering for help, the best thing they got from us was a sense of someone was out there to help them. And that's, yeah, yeah. that's what we want to do. It's really important. Uh, you also mentioned that you have, that you have a very large conference. When is your conference and where is your conference for 2013? This year it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and I should have the dates, but it's the first week in July. There's okay. information about it on our website. Uh, it's relatively very cheap, um, but it's uh, we bring in national speakers. Temple Grandin will be one of the speakers this year. Great. Uh, and and we have uh, about a hundred sessions where um, are geared toward families, uh, individuals, professionals, um, 
but it's also a lot of networking. People uh, get to see old friends when they come back. It's almost like a reunion. Uh, we have about 15, 1,600 people show up. Um, we'll do more this year because it's in the Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio area. There'll be some sessions that relate a little more to those type of uh, services. I mean, breakout sessions, that doesn't mean people from other states should not attend. Right. So we will for them. But um, it, 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 its goal is that when someone leaves there, they're a better professional, they're a better parent, or they're a, a stronger individual with autism. Wonderful. And you also mentioned, too, that uh, a specific area of interest is uh, this idea of transitioning. And so often we encounter parents who are saying, you know, I, I don't know what to do. All my services dried up. I don't know what to do. And we know, of course, that autism is different depending on where you are in the world. And so for the mom in Kansas, it's different than the mom who's in upstate New York. And I think that one of the benefits, and, and I want you to speak to this, is that you have these affiliates all over the country so uh, I would imagine when somebody calls in and says, hey, here's what I need, that you guys are a little bit faster hookup because you, you have a little bit more of a beat on what's happening around the country. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I, we had a call this morning. So someone was telling me about, and, and the call got referred to me, actually, because I spent some time in North Carolina. A parent in North Carolina with a, a daughter with autism was thinking of moving to another state mm -hmm. for a job. And we said, very honestly, you know, before you move, A, you're going to probably lose your Medicaid funding because it's not portable. Right. And the state you're going to has 19,000 people on the waiting list. <sighs> and, and they could not get that information when they called the state's Department of Developmental Disabilities, which I don't understand why not, but I, 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 we hear that a lot. But uh, what we could say to people uh, is, like, if you're moving into this community, here's someone, here, here's the local autism society. Go meet with them. Yeah. You know, they could say, look, it, you know, it, it, this, is the, this is the school system that, that may be a little more responsive to your son or daughter than the other one. Or right. Don't have this teacher. Have this teacher. They'll, they'll, they'll give suggestions. And, um, but they'll also make them welcome. They'll, they'll, they'll usually hook them up with a mentor and get them involved in the community. Well, it's all great. I want to take another break, and when we come back, I want to talk to you about what the mission going forward is and what some of the, what you see from your unique viewpoint of what are the things that parents are asking for, where is the most need um, moving forward. So we're going to take a break, and when we come back, uh, we'll have more with Scott Baddish from the Autism Society of America. Stick with us. Every child with autism deserves a bright future. Without further clarification, the Affordable Care Act could actually result in less benefits for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We urge Catherine Sebelius to clarify the Affordable Health Care Act. She can make one change, one little minor change, to make applied behavioral analysis be part of the health care plan. By signing this petition, you are protecting the health care benefits of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We need to make sure that we are heard and seen. Sign a petition at autism-live.com. Here's how you can show your infinite support. Create your own infinity ribbon. What you're going to do is take a ribbon that's been cut about eight inches long and you're going to grab one end and then twist it and then take the two ends and join them together and then tape it together and then I'm going to flip it around and take another piece of tape and what I have is double sided sticky tape, squeeze down, you have your very own infinity ribbon. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. 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 Welcome back. Our very special guest right now is Scott Baddish, the president of the Autism Society of America, and he has been talking to us about this wonderful organization that we're going to be featuring this week and uh, about what they do and how you might connect with them as a parent. We, we've been showing their website. We're going to show that again. But Scott, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what, what do you see moving forward? Autism has changed. Uh, uh, the way autism is treated has changed a lot in the last few years. What What's the next step for the Autism Society of America? Well, I think there's 
there's both an immediate next step, couple years, and then there's a long term. Mm -hmm. The immediate one is, I think, is how do we uh, continue as a society to provide valued services in, in difficult financial times? Um, so I, I think uh, not only our agency, but all autism providers and families and individuals uh, need to get very involved in the, in, the, in the government, the advocacy, political discussion about you know, how do we use limited resources and, and how do we make sure that cuts don't come at the expense of the most needy. Um, so I think that's something we're more active in now than we've ever been active in. Um, and I think that will have ramifications for years to come because, as we know, when services get cut, they don't usually get restored. Um, I think what's ahead of us is part of that same discussion is how do you make a national, how does the society really help someone with autism um, achieve their full potential? Uh, and how do we uh, assure that a person with autism is is not denied civil rights, uh, is denied everything that is entitled to everything that, that anyone else is? Um, and, and how do we get away from discussing autism as a service need um, to a, a a condition that 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 causes an individual to need some helping hands in some cases a lot in others? but that that person is no less deserving than anyone else we as a nation have helped. Um, and I, I think we at the Autism Society are beginning to transition to those kind of discussions nationally, locally, and state about how autism has to be um, viewed as something that uh, you can't keep putting obstacles in the way of people and families as they try to succeed forward. And that uh, our society puts way too many unnecessary obstacles in that path. Um, and I think you'll see more of the Autism Society moving to say, why are these things being put in the way? Why are people denied um, access to housing? Why are people uh, denied uh, access to a quality education on a regular basis by certain school districts? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think you also see us taking the discussion of autism away from a human service, health service need to more of a societal need. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a rapidly growing number, and um, it's... it's uh, you know, we, we, we have got to start dealing with the bigger issues of high unemployment among people with autism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those no longer could be acceptable to us. And I think we're going to be taking the lead in those areas. Well, I'm looking forward to that. You had mentioned last year, you guys sort of put out a call and said there should be a summit. <clears throat> Excuse me a summit of all of the the different organizations are, are the key players in autism because it seems like even within our own community sometimes there's a certain amount of infighting and you know is this the message is that the message what do we want the message to be and you guys sort of stepped forward last year and and threw out this idea and said there should be a summit where all of the groups could sit down and be one voice and I know we got really excited about that because I think it's a brilliant idea have you ha gotten any traction? Where are you on the summit? Um, there's a lot of infighting that goes on. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, when I was naive to think that this would be an easy task, and it is. And um, <laughs> that's not any statement in any organization. Um, I, before I retire, I'm going to get it done. Okay. Now, whether, or not, whether or not I'm 200 years old when I retire, I don't know. But, but seriously, um, I think we're seeing it starting to come together more. I think um, there's just a lot of dynamics in autism, um, and we have bought and talked and had some meetings with some of the larger groups. And I think there's agreement that, yes, we have to work together, and we have to find things that we could all agree on and maybe disagree on other things, but there's certain things we could agree on. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying do this at the, at the expense of smaller and very important organizations, but I think we felt that we need to get the larger groups involved with autism to, to come to some agreements and, and, and then bring everyone else in and discuss how we could all come to some agreements. Right. Um, I, I think what we're finding in this process is that there's certain legislative actions that we could all agree on. Um, and no one's going to argue that we shouldn't have a stronger uh, 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 restraint and seclusion uh, protection. Yeah. Um, no one's going to argue um, that uh, Medicaid costs, Medicaid cuts shouldn't come at the expense of the most needy. Um, but but then it starts getting a little more 
difficult. Someone may say this is a priority, and we'll say that's great, but it's not our priority or it's not someone right. else's priority. Um, I think we also tend to have a, an agreement that I at the Interagency Advisory Council uh, is, it, 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 it is a potential for greatness, but it's falling far short of that. And um, it's time that uh, we figure out how to make that work uh, for the betterment of everyone and not have it uh, all one-sided by government telling us what to do. Uh, I think that's something we could agree on. So I think this is a process that's going to take time, um, but I will say that in the two years and so I've been here, I think the climate has never been better to have that discussion than it is now. It's yeah. just taking longer than I thought. Well, I appreciate your passion for the subject, and I want you to know that we here at Autism Live support this idea of having a summit, and if there's any way that we can help facilitate that uh, by, you know, helping <laughs> helping to get people at a table, because uh, we'd like to cover it, and more importantly, we'd like to see it happen. It's a thing whose time truly has come, and I think that everybody could benefit from it. So I want you to know that you have our support, and, and if there's anything we can do to help you, uh, we would be thrilled to. I, I would love it. I'd love you guys to come. And I, I, I'll give you exclusivity to it if I have any say. Well, and you know what? I, I sort of say, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't even need exclusivity because we hear about information, and, and if there's 35 other people who want to line up and cover it too, I, I'm all good with it. Um, because at the end of the day, it is about getting people information. So, uh, but I appreciate it. That was very sweet of you. Um, but in any case, uh, sort of last question: What are the challenges? You know, you you have this hotline and you have this space, and you hear from people all over the country. What are the things that you hear the most often? Where are the greatest areas of need that you're hearing from parents currently? I mean, there's no question that the greatest need we hear from is is uh, the total lack of adult services and, and the whole need for transition. Um, that's going to, you know, that's something we hear more and more about. Yeah. This, yeah. The second area that we're hearing increasing, getting more calls about is th this, this division between the haves and the have-nots of uh, access to and receiving services. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's... Um, there's probably nothing worse for a family to find out that your child has autism and then not have any services in your community. And what we've been doing some work on is looking at where that disparity exists. You know, it's heavily based upon income, where there's uh, lower income areas don't have access to services. It's, it, there's a strong correlation between one's ethnicity or race about access to services. And we're starting to get calls about that. You know, um, my son, was diagnosed, or I, I'm seeing signs that my son may have autism, but I don't. There's not even a doctor in my community yeah. or a yeah. professional. Uh, how do I get help? Um, we're working with the CDC on some efforts at that, and it's moving forward in a very good way. But um, you know, this the whole adult service is a really it's a difficult task. But um, you know, what happens to someone when they graduate high school or they leave? They become 21. Uh, and the lack of services. And um, I think that that's, you talk to any national autism agency, they'll tell you that's the number one need. Well, I I can't thank you enough for being here and shedding some light on some, some different subjects for us. And I want to encourage all of our viewers to check out your website to see some of the different ways that they can get involved to get help and support. But also, if they're further along and are in a place where they can be helpful and supportive, you guys are always looking for more people to be to work in your affiliate offices and and I would guess to open more affiliate offices. We love. I mean, yeah. I mean, we have. You know. 107 sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of the country we need volunteers to come together. Um, you know, my contact number, my contact information's on the website. Please contact me or contact anyone on staff. We'd love to work with you. If someone has a problem, they need help, they just need someone to talk to, give us a call. That's what we're here for. And, and I, again, I want to thank you, too. You guys are doing a great job. I know this, I've been on this show, and I look forward to it. Um, but, you know, the ability of giving information 
both from a parent and a professional perspective, is so important. So God bless yeah. you guys for what you're doing. Well, and likewise to you. We're huge fans of what you do and hope that everybody participates and, and gets the help and support that they need. And you're a wonderful, wonderful resource. Please give our best to everybody there. And uh, and please keep us posted about the conference and because we'll make sure to cover it as we get closer to the date for the conference. We'll do it. Thank you again. And thanks for uh, highlighting us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care, Scott. Have a great day. Bye-bye. That was Scott Baddish. He is the president of the Autism Society of America, a really wonderful organization founded by parents uh, that is there specifically to help and support. So I hope that you will visit their website and take a look at the different things that they have to offer, a really wonderful organization. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back to uh, talk about our word for the day assessment and some of the different ways that you can use an assessment to help your child to reach their fullest potential. Stick with us. When you find out you're having a boy, you always think like, oh, he's going to play football, he's going to do this and that. And then when he's diagnosed, all those things get washed away. It's like that piece that's always in the back of your mind, you know, where is he, what is he doing, is he safe? We really didn't know what we were dealing with. I wish that they could have directed me a little bit more and provided me some information. I was a young mom. I didn't know what it was like to raise a boy despite a boy with autism. Hundreds of thousands of families are not getting the help they need for their children with autism all around the country. Act Today is determined to bridge the gap. These families really have to go through a lot to get a grant. The application process isn't easy. The records, the diagnosis proof, they're really battling for their kids. So when we can give them a grant, it is so wonderful to see that they succeed in getting that help for their children. Our founder, Dr. Doreen Grampiche, is an amazing woman, and she is one of the world's foremost authority on behavior of children with autism. She's extremely knowledgeable, and she oversees every single grant we give. She is part of that process. People may think of autism care and treatment as simply schooling or therapy, but you know, we provide important safety supports, things like fencing, for example. The whole family's living in fear of that child running out into traffic. I recently delivered an iPad to a little boy with some of the apps that are out there for children with autism. Miracles happen. I got the iPad from ACT. From ACT, What yeah. did it say? Can you repeat that, Dustin? I got the iPad from that. We have helped so many military families. And when I think of these brave families that are fighting two battles, one to protect our country and one for the right treatment and care for their children, it, it breaks my heart. And I think we have to do more as a nation to help them. There's not a day that doesn't go by that we don't think about it. Some people say, oh, he's normal. You don't see the battles that I see every single day. My husband does have to deploy, and when they get on that bus, that might be the last time that my kids ever see them. So I called, and then they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. I was just like speechless. I just started to cry because, you know, without it, we would, we would have been lost. The ACT grant was a total miracle, and without that, they wouldn't be able to receive a service dog, so we're so appreciative of what they've done for us as a family. Recently, ACT Today funded a program for military children with autism in San Diego, the Inclusion Films program, which is run by Joey Travolta, and teaches uh, kids on the autism spectrum literal filmmaking skills. They learn how to make a movie. Are we ready? There you go, got it. Okay. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. And they're with people who are supporting them and they're making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart. So it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. 
It's so fulfilling when I get letters. One stands out for me, a, a boy who was 14 with Asperger's, and we gave him a grant to go to a drama camp. He wrote to us and said, Dear Act Today, thank you for letting me belong for the first time in my life. These kids are remarkable. You know, we underestimate them. They're so knowledgeable, they're so capable, and we can change the life of a family, which means changing the life of a community. Welcome back. Our word for today was assessment, and we talked a little bit about uh, why you get an assessment done, why an assessment is useful for your child. It's really that snapshot of looking at saying, here's where we are, so that when you say, well, here's where we want to go, then you can measure the distance between the two, right? And come up with an effective plan. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier today that I would talk, that I promised I would talk about uh, at this point in the show is the assessment that's available in skills. Now, is it the only assessment that's available to you no, uh, not by any stretch of the imagination. But what I love about the skills assessment, uh, and it is in the skills program, which you can get online, skillsglobal.com, um, you have the ability, there are so many things that skills does, right? It, it gives you a curriculum to be able to follow once you get the snapshot and say, okay, I'm, I'm here and I need to get to here. Here are all the steps in between and the lesson plans to go with them, which is lovely and brilliant. But even if you were just to section out and say, okay, I'm just going to look at skills for the assessment portion, I'd like to make a case for how exciting that is as a parent. Um, that it is a very lengthy, very exhaustive, researched assessment um, that shows that it does give effective, and that's one of the things that we want to make sure that we are always is effective, gives you an effective snapshot of where your child is. Um, it is something that you can do online in your own speed and in your own time. And it really is, I consider it an investment that you make in your child's because you sit there and it can be poignant sometimes you're sitting there answering questions about what your child can do and what they can't do and sometimes that's a bummer sometimes it's frustrating sometimes you just you know go Ugh, I can't right now right we talked earlier about taking things in in small chunks well it's already chunked for you in that it has eight curricula areas and within each curricula area they're going to ask questions of you uh, about a specific topic so maybe you're just looking at eye contact and there might be 14 questions about eye contact and you click on and say you know i'm going to answer these questions now if you decided i just can't make it through all 14 questions and uh, quite honestly when i was taking the assessment that happened to me a time or two where i just went ah uh, just I just can't right now. You can save your work and you can come back to it. And it, it'll show you exactly where you left off. It has all these wonderful color-coded bars that show you this is exactly where you are so that you can get a, a visual snapshot of how you're doing on the assessment. Very reinforcing. Um, but usually, most of the time, you can go in and, and they're chunked for you in such a way that you can get through 14 questions. Um, and you get that done and you see that bar move and you say, I've done something today. Now, that's great in and of itself uh, because you get, get that done and then you can share that with the professionals in your child's life. You can share it with their teacher. You can share it with their ABA provider and say, here is a snapshot of where my child is right now. But then you can also click and see on graphs exactly where your child is uh, in, a, in a pictorial way that is very clear that you see this is where your child should be for their age level and you can see where the gaps are and it really gives you a visual so that you can look and say wow my child's receptive language is higher than their expressive language and so you see a strength there and say great I'm gonna play to that strength and I'm also going to take into consideration that here is a weakness their expressive language is not where it should be so I'm going to put these lessons in to help my child you're gonna get more efficient more effective all very useful and very productive. Now, cycle into that as well. 
that once you know where your child is behind, you can pick those lessons and they come with IEP benchmarks. This is one of these things that I was saying to you guys about this year when I went to go to my son's IEP, instead of having to wonder because I had that assessment done and, and instead of sitting there thinking, okay, well, they have these goals. Are they really tailored to my child's specific needs for where he is right now? I didn't have to guess. I could go in and say, I want a goal that's about social, language on the playground and I could see where he was at and say this lesson is appropriate for him age-wise and it's appropriate for him skill-wise and I didn't have to guess push the button and it printed out for me the IEP language I just had to fill in a couple of blanks about dates very easy to do very effective and as I mentioned as a result of that my child has goals for the playground in his IEP for the first time this year. Very exciting and I got to that because I invested in my child and did that skills assessment. Want to remind all of you that there is a free um, trial period on skills that you can sign up and get 14 days for free, uh, have access to the whole program. On the 15th day, it will charge your credit card, or you can get the skills light where you can go in and do a smaller version of it, not have access to everything, and don't have to put a credit card in. But very soon, in the coming weeks, we are going to be giving away a skills subscription. So I want you to stay tuned for that because, as you know, I'm a big fan of it and I'm thrilled that they're going to let us give away a subscription. We are down to the end here and Emily is cycling through some of the different ways that you can be in contact with us because even as this show ends the conversation continues I hope you guys will take advantage we've got some really exciting things going on this week Evelyn Gould's going to be with us tomorrow making room with Evelyn she's a BCBA that'll be wonderful on Wednesday of course we have Ask Dr. Doreen and Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy on Wednesday we are going to be having an autism advocate here with us talking about uh, the different when do you need a lawyer when do you need an advocate what's the difference how can it help you when you're in a situation where you're not quite sure how to proceed. Uh, so that'll be really exciting. On Thursday, we have Angela Pers Persicky, and on Friday, we'll have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. It's an exciting week here. We're really thrilled. We're going to be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.